and night is with me. I feel very, very bad because they did an unhuman thing to Armenians and any Armenian cannot forget it. Never, never. In the Bible it is written about hell. That's wrong. The real hell is what I saw. I've seen it and I've lived it with my eyes. It was a long journey through the desert. We were driven into the desert where a nation died in the sands. The World at War. A conflict never before witnessed by mankind. A war waged with modern technology. Railroad, telegraph, and poison gas. The first total war. Spreading from Western Europe to the highlands of the Middle East, the homeland of the Armenians. And something else, the darkest invention yet is by nation states, genocide. This was the systematic annihilation of a whole people, the Armenians. How did it happen? Who was involved? focused on deadly combat in Europe, the Turkish government exterminated most of its Armenian citizens. A little known fact is the role Germany played in this planned genocide of the Armenians. How complicit were the Germans? What was Germany's part in the cover-up of this terrible crime? The road to world war began in the 19th century with the consolidation of Germany into a nation-state under Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. Through industrial might, Kaiser Wilhelm II would turn Germany into a major world power. thrust eastward towards Mesopotamia, now Iraq, would make them a world power. By cutting Britain off from her empire in India, Germany would acquire the natural resources of the Middle East. With the establishment of a railway from Berlin through Turkey to Baghdad, Germany might achieve its imperialist dream. be the Kaiser's economic lifeline to the Middle East. The Kaiser proclaimed, we need Mesopotamia. Prior to the First World War, German writers like Paul Rohrbach introduced the idea of moving Armenians out of Turkey and resettling them in Mesopotamia. The industrious Armenians, he believed, would make the desert bloom. There was in German colonial policy this very brutal method of dealing with colonial peoples when they wanted to steal their land and take over their goods. Uh, it was a part of colonial policy and certainly therefore there were people within the German governmental establishment that could be sympathetic and understanding of the deportation policies. General Komar von Goltz, advisor to the Ottoman army, believed in uprooting and relocating Christian Armenians for military reasons. He wanted to remove Armenians and to resettle them in the south, in Syria and Mesopotamia.
Turks influenced by German views on population relocation as they watch steel rails slice through Armenian regions? What we do know is that these same rails in the hands of the Turks became a tool for massacre and extermination. Railroad was the single most important German overseas investment prior to World War I. It was owned by the Deutsche Bank, the most important German private bank. The railroad was a point of pride not only for German public opinion but also for diplomats. The success of future German expansion in the Middle East depended fully on this venture. The German railway was to extend from Berlin through Turkey all the way to Baghdad. But on the eve of World War I, it was still unfinished. The Turks, like the Germans, also had imperialist designs. Their leaders, Talat and Enver, wanted to create a Turkish nation by destroying ethnic minorities. Their hope? Stop the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Their dream? Bolster Turkish power by expansion to the east, through the Armenian highlands, to unite with the Turkic peoples of Central Asia. On the eve of the First World War, Turkey entered into a military agreement with Germany. The main provision of the treaty, a German chief of staff in every Turkish army command to approve all troop movements and strategic decisions by the Turks. Over 12,000 German soldiers served in Turkey during the First World War. Some, like Rudolf Haus, a youth of 16, volunteered for duty. The German and the Turk, a marriage of convenience, the union of two imperialist dreams, but for one problem, the Armenians. The Armenians had lived at the crossroads of Europe and Asia for over 3,000 years. They had become Christians in the 4th century. In the 14th century, they were conquered by the Muslim Turks. The Armenians. A proud people with a rich heritage of architecture, art, and literature. In the 1800s, the Turks feared that the Armenians would one day want freedom and autonomy. Out of envy and greed, the Armenians were ruthlessly massacred for political, economic, and religious reasons. But the Turco-German alliance brought in a new brand of intolerance, racial stereotyping. Many in the German ruling class and military thought Armenians were an inferior race, hindering German plans in Turkey. Ival Banse concluded that the Armenians should be eliminated from the face of the earth. The Armenians were racially weaker than the Turks, argued Friedrich Naumann. The weaker nation must succumb. The Armenians are nine times worse than the Jews, said the German general Bratzai von Schellendorf, chief advisor to the Turkish military. They also developed an ethnic stereotype, the racist notion that the Armenians were the Jews of the Orient, sucking the blood of the Ottoman economy, like the accused the Jews were doing in Germany. The German officer corps, largely anti-Semitic in its views, readily accepted the notion of the bad Armenian. The Germans' racism and the Turks' political fear of the Armenians made for a lethal mix. Genocide, 1915.
most of the Armenians in Turkey were annihilated, brutally killed in the streets where they were born, driven to the secret places of the mountainside, and starved in the desert wastelands. The carnage was inhuman, barbaric, total. It rolled as an angry wave over the Armenian people. The poor virgin girls, they took them away. Poor, poor things. We were crying and wailing. We pleaded with God. You must not forget our cries, our tears. They laid us on the sand, and the dead bodies strewn about. We walked over the corpses, hungry, thirsty, no food to eat, nothing to wear. We were going where they were taking us. I don't know. I don't know. What does it all mean? Europeans and Americans witnessed the massacres. In her diary entry of July 10th, 1915, American medical missionary Tacey Atkinson stated who she thought was responsible for the genocide unfolding in Turkey. Among the Turks and Armenians both, it seems to be pretty well known that this thing is from the Germans. We all know that such clear-cut, well-planned, and well-carried-out work is not the method of the Turk. The German, the Turk, and the devil make a triple alliance not to be equaled in the world for cold-blooded hellishness. On the brink of World War, though, the story had yet to unfold. Constantinople, the Ottoman capital. Armenians are at the peak of a cultural renaissance on the eve of the First World War. Gometas Vartaved, the celebrated Armenian composer, held concerts with a choir of 300. They performed the classics, Beethoven, Constantinople has not seen anything like this. To the concerts came not only Armenians, Turks also came, with diplomats and officials of Great Britain, France, and all of the other countries came. Also came, aside from other Turks, Talat Pasha, the greatest murderer of the Armenians. This man, who had mastered a few words of Armenian, would come and say, Good evening, sirs. Good evening, ladies. I could see it from above where I was sitting, because I could only afford lower price seats, and I would look down. And this man, with mockery and in his heart forming his schemes, outwardly with a smile, he would put the Armenians to sleep. Talat would soon get his chance. With the assassination in Sarajevo of Austrian Crown Prince Franz Ferdinand in June 1914, the world was now at war, a cover for Turkish designs. Soon Russian and Turkish troops were locked in deadly combat. Battling snow and ice, there were massive losses on both sides. The defeated and humiliated Turks took their revenge on Armenian civilians. United States Ambassador Henry Morgenthau wrote about the slaughter in the area of Vaughan. The Turks' army turned their weapons upon the Armenian women, children, and old men. This procedure was repeated in about 80 Armenian villages, and in three days, 24,000 Armenians were murdered. The Armenian elite in Constantinople was greatly concerned. 
On April 23rd, they met in an emergency meeting. They decided to do everything to assure the Ottoman government of their loyalty. On April 24, the Armenian Petrarch, Zavin, visited Talat and told him, we will be loyal. Rebuffed by the Turkish leaders, the frightened Armenians appealed to the Germans. Baron Hans von Wagenheim was the German ambassador in Constantinople. He refused to help. Sometime later, Wagenheim called the Armenians vermin. I shall do nothing whatever for the Armenians, he told U.S. Ambassador Henry Morgenthau. At midnight, the Ottoman government sent its police force to arrest the Armenian leaders in Constantinople. composer Kamadas Vatibed. The Turks missed high school teacher Varam Eretsian, who had been away on holiday. On the morning of April 24th, I left home to go to the school. Along the way, I noticed that there was a sadness on the faces of the Armenians. I figured that something had happened, but I, I did not know what it was. I arrived to the school and asked if the headmaster was inside. His assistant said, don't you know what happened? Barjan and hundreds of intellectuals were arrested. I fled immediately. On April 27th, the Armenians contacted Morgenthau, hoping the United States, a neutral in the war, would intercede. Ambassador Morgenthau responded to the Armenian plea and tried to change the German stance, but they had made their choice. No help for the Armenians was to materialize. A few hours after the Armenian leaders were arrested in Constantinople, British and Australian forces attacked Turkey and Gallipoli. Bombardment was raging off the Turkish coast. At the same time, Armenian intellectuals were transported by rail to their deaths. The Turks stood their ground and finally brought the Allied attack to a standstill. The fact that the British and the French and the Empire troops eventually had to withdraw from the Peninsula in December of 1915 and January 1916 confirmed in the minds of many Turks uh, their outstanding military capabilities and made them uh, more self-confident than they had been before, which also made them less willing to listen to German advice on any and all matters. The Turks now embarked on a bold plan to destroy an entire nation by massacre by deportation. This gigantic uprooting of people was along the lines some Germans had suggested. When the Turkish authorities gave the orders for these deportations, they were merely giving the death warrant to a whole race. It really represented a new form of massacre. on the door and next thing we know that the door was open. The Turkish officer opened the door with his sword and asked for my father. My father and my father went there and says, come on, we're taking you. Come on, come on, let's go. And my father said, let me put my shoes. He says, no, you don't need any shoes. Where are you going? How did the Turks devise this idea to expel from their homeland an entire nation of two million people? Enver Pasha, the Turkish Minister of War, was one of the architects of the Armenian plan. He had lived in Germany and was an admirer of the Kaiser. He was close to top Germans as well as military officers, including Bronsart von Schellendorf, Chief of Staff known for his extreme racist views on Armenians. 
Was German racism a factor in the Turkish resolve to find a final solution to their Armenian minority problem? It's one of the great questions, I think one of the main questions about the First World War. The question, did the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans know even maybe the details of the atrocities, of the massacres, of the Ottoman government towards the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. The other question, if they knew something for the evil details, why did they not, did they not prevent these massacres? June 17, 1915. German Ambassador Wagenheim informed Berlin about Turkish motives. Quoting Talent, Wagenheim said the deportations were motivated merely by military considerations. The Ottoman government was using the World War to eliminate the Armenians. Wagenheim stressed this would also be in the interests of the Germans. But how far would Germany go to assist its ally? Top German officers in Turkey, would they help the Turks with their cleanup of Armenians? General Bronsart von Schellendorf was not an ordinary commander or general. He was the German who ranked highest in the Ottoman army. He chose to give his approval to Talat's deportation order. Historian Vahak and Dabrin implicate Schellendorf more closely with the deportation program. On July 25, 1915, Brossard von Schellendorf signed an order providing for the deportation to use his language for the Armenian people. In other words, not for any region or section of the country, but for the Armenian population as a whole. He used the language Ermeni Ahali. In that order, again, he used the Turkish code word for massacre, which is Shedi Day, severe measures to be applied. Severe measures, the code word for extermination. Germany's industrial technology would expedite the Turks' deportation and massacre of Armenians. For the first time in history, railway transportation became a means for mass extermination. Wholesale deportation of large civil populations towards extermination was introduced into history. The Baghdad Railway Company transported tens of thousands each week towards the Syrian deserts where they were to die in the scorching desert suns. In the summer of 1915, Franz Günther director of the Berlin-Baghdad Railway Company in Constantinople, sent a secret report to Arthur von Wiener, director of the Deutsche Bank in Berlin. Gunther denounced the extermination of the Armenians. In one instance, he described how 800 old people, women and children, were rounded up and forced into freight wagons. He was appalled and said, what is happening on the railroad line is moderate compared to what's happening in the rest of the country. The conditions of these deportees were deplorable. They were herded into railroad carts, which were used for the transport of animals. No water was given. Babies were born on the train and thrown out by desperate mothers in order to kill them right on the spot. Talat, Minister of the Interior in the Ottoman government, knew how rapid transportation and communication would advance his schemes. On August 15th, Talat sent a telegram to all provinces demanding to know how many Armenians had been deported, how many were on the road. Germans operating the railway in Turkey were upset. Director Gunter sent another urgent report to Vinna, marked secret on October 30th, 1915. He included a photograph of deportees with another sarcastic note referring to the railroad 
as the bearer of culture in Turkey. Referring sympathetically to the Armenians, he concluded, these are our so-called sheep wagons, in which 880 persons are transported in 10 wagons. The Germans built the railway as a strategic lifeline to the Middle East. The Turks were now using it to transport people to their death. I'm an eyewitness. I saw it. People don't believe it. But out of my family of seven, only my mother and I survived. I was born in Bandarma, near the site of Old Troy. They said, the soldiers told us, the Turkish soldiers, that it was for our safety to move us. Well, they went uh, straight by straight, you know. And they came and locked our doors and sealed it and took the key away with them. And they put us in uh, boxcars. The train took us as far as Afyon Karaisar. From there again, they put us on the train and we went all the way somewhere near Konya in the interior of Turkey. There were many, many exiles from different cities of Turkey. They we had to walk after that. I saw with my own eyes a poor neighbor of ours from Bandarma. She couldn't walk anymore and uh, they took hold of her and throw her into the burning fire. And my father's first cousin, Der Hagopian, lost his mind in front of us. As the deportations and massacres continued, the Turks tried to convince the German ally that the Armenians were rebels. In the spring of 1915, Max von Scheibner-Victor served as German consul in the city of Erzurum. Between May 15th and 20th, he told German ambassador of Agenheim that the Turkish charges against the Armenians were untrue. All house searches ended without finding any incriminating evidence. No bombs or anything like bombs could be found. Schordner Richter refuted official Turkish and German propaganda that the Armenians were rebels. When he provided bread to the Armenian refugees and tried to protect them, General von Schellendorf objected. Fearing for his life, Richter later started to carry an extra revolver. Wagenheim ordered a response. The Armenians had started the trouble, he said. The Ottoman government was merely protecting them. This argument, Gedankengang, was to be the new official German line on the massacres. Thus it was the German government who initiated the denial of the Armenian genocide and formulated the major denialist argument which is promoted up to our days. Germany had an interest in the Ottoman denial of the Armenian genocide because any disinformation would also diminish the question of German responsibility and participation in the crime. On July 16th, Wagenheim required that reports be produced showing that Germany was not responsible in any way for the massacre of Armenians. At the Berlin Foreign Office, State Undersecretary Arthur Zimmermann went a step further. He ordered the fabrication of reports that would show the Armenians were treasonable and guilty. The German government chose to manipulate its own record deliberately. Not only were the consorts stopped from intervening on behalf of Armenians, now they were asked to denounce the victims. The Ottoman 
Cleveland program was centrally coordinated. Timetables kept the trains running on schedule, moving thousands of Armenians to their death. The Turks told their German ally that the deportations were temporary, applied only to Armenians in the war zones. Walter Rossler, the German consul in Aleppo, did not believe it. I find no words to describe the depths of this untruth. Rossler had in fact sent numerous reports about Armenians being murdered by the Turks, but his superiors ignored his recommendations. On August 26th, 1915, Talat again demanded from each district the number of Armenians being banished. When did they leave? How many? What percentage of the total population did these constitute? The Germans, meanwhile, were rushing to complete the railway to stop the British advance into the Middle East. As the World War raged, German and Turkish interests were diverging. The Germans wanted to move military equipment to the war zone. Turks wanted to transport Armenians from western Turkey by rail toward their death. At the same time, in the eastern provinces, the Turks were herding Armenians into caravans. Thousands of towns and villages were emptied of Armenians. The columns of Armenians on foot and by rail met at the Taurus Mountains. Many were forced to build the railroad. Their labor would hasten the trains moving their compatriots to extinction. In route, a German commander with two Turkish assistants made a stop. He said, all of you have to come and work on this road. We said that we could not do it. We were city folk. We were not villagers able to work. It's impossible. So he beat many people with his cane. He hit my mother with a cane. She almost lost consciousness. Stories of German complicity and responsibility in the Armenian genocide circulated among both Turks and Armenians. A German officer with Turkish soldiers under his command killed people. He had the approval of the Turks. Two thousand persons to a valley and killed them. My godfather's son escaped, half dead, and told us that the German had slaughtered them all. On July 7th, Ambassador Wagenheim confirmed the Turkish government is trying to exterminate the entire Armenian race. Three weeks later, the German Foreign Office informed all embassies that the slaughter of Armenians was systematic and the extermination was total. Franz Günther, the distressed head of the Berlin-Baghdad Railway, again appealed to his superior, Arthur Gwinner, in Berlin. How will one be able to justify in front of history that all this is happening directly under our eyes without us moving? I don't know. Dr. Hilmar Kaiser investigated Ottoman documents before Turkey closed its archives to unbiased foreign scholars. He found hundreds of telegrams in the Turkish archives from Talat. One was dated August 25th, 1915. Talat insisted that Armenian deportees in Bozanti complete their deadly journey to the desert. How many Armenians had congregated at Bozanti? Talat wanted to know. He ordered the 
that the deportees were now to move on foot to conserve railway space. Bazanti was to remain a major construction site along the Berlin-Baghdad Railway. As the Germans tried to close the gaps in the rail line, Armenians continued to be deported by foot and by rail. supposed to be the fortunate ones. Then we went, they put us on train again towards the Syrian desert. From there on we had to walk again. We have been on the road for five months since we left Bandarma. Just walking, you know, it was a death march. There were bodies all around us on the, uh, on the sides. I saw with my eyes a pregnant woman among us and uh, because she was lagging, you know, the Turkish soldiers put the sword on her stomach and the baby came out of her and uh, the mother died there too, right there. We were at the top of the mountain, nobody was talking, they were all silent to walk on continually. They won't let us bury our dear ones. That that march was like a call of ants or a huge caterpillar walking and walking slowly. They all knew they were going to die. missionaries were sending detailed reports on the events they were witnessing in Turkey. The German government tried to silence the missionaries, afraid the truth about the massacres would undermine the alliance with Turkey. German public opinion denounced the policy of doing nothing to help the Armenians. Meanwhile, the Germans continued their desperate drive to finish the railway to Baghdad. German employees of the railway company rescued some women and children from certain death and put them on construction crews. Others were pressed into service. They made us climb the mountain. We descended on the side where the Germans were building the railroad tracks. They told us we had to work on these roads. They gave us small hammers so we could break the rocks, the size of apples, lemons, so that they could arrange them between the rails. During the first year for the entire winter, we worked on those roads. We broke the rocks. We filled the wagons. We dumped the rocks so they would reach the level of the railroad tracks. And it was there that all my relatives died. My grandmother, my father, my older sister, my mother, and my sister. The matter of German complicity is illustrated by the case of a German colonel by the name of Betrich. Colonel Betrich was in charge of railway transportation in the Ottoman general headquarters and on October 3, 1915, he signed an order as a result of which thousands of Armenian railroad workers who were involved in the construction of the strategically critical Baghdad railway road were to be deported and in that order he used the standard Turkish code word namely apply severe measures Shedide in Turkish and that's what exactly happened the, the bulk of the Armenian railroad workers after deportation were eliminated through massacre and other methods of mass murder the German Konyago became alarmed when he found out that a high-ranking German officer was stupid enough to sign his name. Franz Günther, representing the Deutsche Bank in Constantinople, 
pointed the finger at the German government's responsibility. This is what he said about Bertri implicating the German government. <clears throat> Our enemies will someday pay a good price to obtain possession of this document signed by Colonel Bertri. They will be able to prove that the Germans have not only done nothing to prevent the Armenian persecutions, but they even issued certain orders to this effect. As the extent of German complicity became known after the war, German authorities feared the world would hold them accountable for the Armenian genocide. As late as 1919, Dr. Otto Gobert, chief Middle East advisor in the German Foreign Office, was concerned about German financial responsibility resulting from the massacres. He said that this is a grave incrimination from which we must free ourselves for reasons that are also financial. Otherwise, we, Germany, will be held liable for damages. In his own German language, eine schwere Belastung Man will uns für den Schaden haftbar machen. This is the most explicit language recognizing the dangers of financial liability, ability that is indemnity or reparation or compensation. Constantinople, winter, 1915. Telegrams are again dispatched from the Turkish Ministry of Interior to the provinces. One rebukes local officials. Too many Armenians are being left in towns in proportion to Muslims. They also order that the Armenian population should not exceed 5% of the uh, population in the uh, areas that the Armenians were sent. Many Armenians try to escape to Aleppo the last major town on the death march to Deir Zor, a small desolate village, the final killing fields. The Turks were deporting the Armenians faster than they had room on their railway cars. <laughs> Orada başladı, evlat kaçmaya. Orada başladı, evlat kaçmaya. Türkler başladı, alıp kaçmaya. Alıp kaçmaya, dini bin uğruna ölen Ermeni. Dini bin uğruna ölen Ermeni. The Armenians invented that song. Their hearts were broken. They would sing and weep at the same time. We would sing it, and we would also cry instead of praying. Katma was a small railway station northwest of Aleppo. It was selected as a point of transit because the Ottoman government had decided that Armenians must not pass through Aleppo where they might find shelter and go into hiding. Thus Katma, the open fields around Katma, became a plain of deportees where they waited until they had to enter the Syrian desert for their final stages on the road to extermination. Who brought you here? The Turks. After they evicted us, they drove us all the way to the deserts. Why did they bring you to Katma? It was just a gathering place, a station. Here they would come and stay for 10 or 15 days. And then they would be sent out to Derzor. After that, another group would arrive. These would go. In place would come others until all the Armenians were exterminated. Yeah, from Konya to Katma, that was the first destination we re reached Katma. 
Then we arrived there, we never believed. There were acres and acres of tents. So many people there. Finally, they squeezed us in. They told us to put up the tents. And we have put up the tent. We stay there. And meantime, they keep shipping people to desert. Every day, trains were full of, full of people. They were shipping to desert. We stayed there for two weeks. There were no food, no anything. People were dying from starvation. They were digging out big graves, big enough to throw maybe 100 people in there. The situation of Armenian people was terrible in Kadma. German Consul Walter Rossler in Aleppo was aware of the concentration camps. Again, he reported to Berlin. Thousands of Armenians are being deported to Katma. Two trains a day, blood along the tracks, corpses. Something extraordinary has gone through the land. Rossler also had a breakdown of the total number of Armenians in his district. Those identified in red had already been killed. Again, his government refused to intervene. Typhus was rampant in Turkey. In the city of Erzingan, determined to find a vaccine, the Turks injected typhus into healthy Armenians, using them as guinea pigs. German colleagues in the same city did not stop the deadly experiments by the Turks. Dr. Ali Sahib lured Armenian children to a school steam bath for disinfection. Witnesses testified he gassed them to death. One month earlier, the Romanians reported to the British that the Germans had transported poison gas to Turkey in diplomatic pouches. Turkish expulsion orders swept the country like a gigantic broom, emptying towns and villages. Some were driven southward towards Palestine. German troops operating in the area witnessed the events. Among them was the young volunteer Rudolf Haus. The Armenians of the city of Urfa had heard of the deportations. The carnage was moving southward. They knew they were next. Because of the oppression of the Armenians at the hands of the Turks, a few of the young people went into the mountains and in groups they resisted protecting their homes and their families. When the people of Urfa realized that the Armenian leaders elsewhere have been taken away, they decided to defend themselves. They said, instead of dying in the desert wilderness, we will die here. Knowing what their fate was going to be, the Armenians in Ufa start uh, uh, fighting with the Turks. The Armenian section in Ufa had walls around it. The Turks couldn't keep up with the Armenians, so they sent for reinforcements. The Germans brought in the 75 millimeter howitzers. The German officer, Major Eberhard Graf Rufsky, personally led the attack against the Armenians. He targeted the Armenian quarter and bombarded the American mission complex. Now in October 1915, he wrote in a letter to his wife, there is heavy street fighting in progress. The rebels are well equipped with weapons and ammunition. After the battle, Wolfskiel walked through the streets. He wrote to his wife, I could smell the burning buildings and corpses. I personally led the attack on the houses. 
I love the sound of the bullets and the house-to-house -house fighting. He was a brilliant officer, and he had to do his duty. In his eyes, the minions were rebels. Later, Major Wolfskill acknowledged the Armenians of Ufa were not rebels. Nonetheless, he felt no remorse for the victims. Talat's goal was becoming clear. He had already boasted to United States Ambassador Morgenthau we have already disposed of three quarters of the Armenians. We've got to finish them off. He confirmed the deportations were the result of prolonged and careful deliberation. Morgenthau confronted German Ambassador Wagenheim, accusing Germany of collusion in the genocide. The world will always hold Germany responsible. The guilt of these crimes will be your inheritance forever. I do not claim that Germany is responsible for these massacres in the sense that they instigated them, but she is responsible in the sense that she had the power to stop them and did not use it. All you say may be true, replied the German ambassador, but the big problem that confronts us is to win this war. And I turned from him in disgust. Wagenheim rose to leave. As he did so, he gave a gasp, and his legs suddenly shot from under him. I jumped and caught the man as he was falling. Two days later, on October 24th, 1915, Wagenheim was dead. Wagenheim did not initiate the Armenian deportation. The Turks were responsible. But Wagenheim masterminded the denial and the cover-up of Turkish crimes against the Armenians. German complicity legally and morally and politically entails the idea of German responsibility. Specifically, legally speaking, people are responsible for the consequences of their acts, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and to the extent that German military and civilian officials cooperate with the Turks in the deportation of the Armenians, they are responsible for the genocidal outcome of these massive deportations. Were the Germans in any way responsible for what happened to the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire? My considered uh, answer would be no. Were they complicit in some of the things that happened? My answer would be yes. The main reason being that they were afraid to lose a valued ally, military ally, in the middle of a major war if they pushed their uh, objections to the Armenian persecutions too far. Was that an amoral point of view? Yes. The remarks by the head of the German government, Chancellor Beitmann Holwig, confirmed German complicity in the Armenian genocide. We will need the Turks, no matter if Armenians perish or not. In 1918, Turkey lost the war. Four years of the Turco-German alliance. Genocide was the price. One and a half million Armenians annihilated in a frenzy of mass murder. The Turkish perpetrators escaped with the help of German generals and diplomats. They were given refuge in Germany. No German was ever brought to justice for crimes against the Armenians. Some, like Max von Schäubner Richter, joined the early Nazi movement. Richter became a close friend of Adolf Hitler, 
and died taking the bullet intended for Hitler in 1923 in Munich. Seventeen years later, the teenage soldier Rudolf Huss became the commandant of the Auschwitz extermination camp. The secret genocide in Turkey had become a part of Germany's collective memory. Within a generation, Germany would again be involved in crimes against humanity. Nightmares in my head, I fear That the thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Anxiety, filling up every space, no privacy uh, And silently, it could build and build until you finally see Whoa, it's taking over, damn no closure, moving closer No exposure, I just wanna be a loner uh, some can't stay sober, looking over all their shoulders Like moving boulders just to get out of the home It sucks, I've had enough, I don't wanna feel the stuck Under the rug, all my problems that I shove I got nightmares in my head, I fear That the thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear That the thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I've been feeling weird, I can't seem to focus 